I would almost guarantee it if you start breaking it down and talking to CrossFit competitors and you start talking about like what they really did to prepare themselves mentally for that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's something they've been doing for a long time. And it became a routine. It's no different than watching a batter step into the batter's box. And they got this little three second routine they got to get themselves, you know, ready and focused. Welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lua Viva in San Diego, California. And today I'm joined by the founder of Team Elite Performance, Dean Wellens. Dean, thanks for being on. Absolutely. Thanks for thanks for taking the time and making our schedules work and look forward to it. Yeah, for sure. Can you give us a little bit of an idea for the listeners about uh, what you do and what it is that teams kind of contact you to do? Sure. Um, I think I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start that answer with what what we what I don't do. <laughs> Although you know the, the name Team Elite Performance certainly sounds like team building, and when I start talking to people, like, oh, you do team building, and we've almost tried to kind of stay away from that uh, catchphrase, I guess, almost because team building has almost gotten like a negative connotation these days. <laughs> yeah, I think of people doing the trust fall. There, there you go, trust falls, and you know that kind of thing, and. And in fact, I was doing a podcast recently and I told the guy, I said, yeah, you want to get a lot of people at work to not to call in sick, tell them you're going to do team building the next day Yeah, <laughs> and see how many people actually show up. So what we really focused on was what I would call people building. And, and so it's really nothing more than kind of going back to that definition of success that we talked about is, you know, giving, giving people a chance to opportunity to be their very, very best. And I'm a huge believer that uh, we all, I, everybody, you know, haven't, haven't, whether it's coaches, mentors, partners, people to push us. I mean, that's, I think that's a, a win in life. I mean, you look at people that are successful, that is certainly one of those foundational things is they, they surround themselves with people who are not just good at what they do, but better than, you know, than what they do. So they can be that, so they can kind of model those behaviors. Yeah, sure. So other than team or outside of team building, when you have, when you're talking professional development, do you come up against a lot of, uh, we'll say friction in that area too? Because I think from what I've seen, there's a lot of people that are not open to that unless they're an entrepreneurial type or they have a reason to be. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll answer that with kind of an, an example. Um, you know, one of the, I guess, sessions that I've done, it does deals with a lot of public speaking, which, you know, as we all know, it's kind of one of the biggest fears of people. And, and it's interesting. I do a class on leadership and, you know, I'll get, you know, business people and everything in there. And, you know, and a lot of them will say, well, you know, what's the one thing you want to get better at? And okay, sometimes that's kind of an easy out answer. They want to get better at speaking in public. But then I have a public speaking class, and you know how many people sign up for that? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So back to what your question. So, so depending on whether it's friction or just fear, I mean, that's. But yeah, there, there's no doubt. I mean, that's why you know most of what I do is either with with either you know high school age, college age, younger people, and honestly, it's because they don't have quite as many walls. So as we get a little bit older, we tend to build up these walls, and then going to doing something out of our comfort zone, which is as we all know, that's where we grow. That gets scary. Um, really scary sometimes. So yeah, there there definitely can be some pushback or some friction just because because people are afraid of it. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I went through a public speaking course and and I don't know how true this is, but the instructor said that public speaking is uh, it's the biggest fear in America, second only to the sound of a shotgun. And which which makes perfect sense, and, yeah. you know. And, and and it's interesting too. I was I was doing a, a session with um with a, with a company I work with here in town and. And we were talking about this concept of public speaking and, and how it really is you know, a lot of different uh, – it's rated as kind of the number one fear. But the reality is is that people don't actually have a fear of public speaking. You know, what they've, what they've really got fears of is fears of rejection, fears of embarrassment, fears of not saying the right thing, fears of, you know, people not accepting me, fears of, you know, lack of confidence, lack of belief in myself. And then what we don't do is we don't speak in front of people. And, you know, I use the analogy like we really don't raise our hand anymore. I mean you think about little kids – you know, my daughter is in kindergarten right now, and I got to go in and speak to her class for 30 minutes. And, you know, I walked in the door and I said, hey, um, I didn't even tell them what we were going to do. I said, I need a volunteer. Well, 30 little hands went up, like, you know, like freaking out, not, you know, all excited. And they didn't even know what we were going to do. Yeah. Right. And, but if I go, if I sit in front of a group of adults and I say, hey, I need a volunteer, <laughs> you know, not very many hands go up. <laughs> Well, they haven't had a lifetime of rejection yet, right? <laughs> well, that's and that's exactly what it is. So that, you, you hit it right on the head. So then, what do we don't do? We don't raise our hand. You know, we we start to pull back. We, you know, I mean, so yeah, because because why not? Because we're really afraid to speak in public, but we're afraid of those other things. And then what we don't do is speak in public. Um, I was working with a, a, a high level college baseball coach, and, and he was talking about that. And he said, "Yeah, I've got a fear of like speaking in front of people." And so I asked him that question. I said, "Coach." What is it really? Let me let me give you some really common ones. And he sat and listened. He's like, 
He's like, yeah, I really got like a fear that people aren't going to listen to me or take me seriously. And I told him, I said, if we don't deal with that, I said, I can give you all the public speaking skills in the world, but if we don't deal with that, then all that other stuff's going to be, you know, it's going to be really kind of fake and it's not going to be real. But if you deal with that belief that maybe people aren't going to listen to you, you know, you got a lot better chance of, of becoming a much better speaker and influencing people, especially in a position like that where you've got, you know, lots of influence over people. Sure. You, you mentioned the value of pushing people to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. In 2017, age of social media, I think everybody says that, right? Like there's memes everywhere. It's like, you know, comfort zones or, you know, it's like that's everyone pushes people to get out of their comfort zone. I can't think of a meme right now. How do you push people to get uncomfortable though? Like what, like what are the tactics that you actually use? Because that's a pretty hard thing to get people to do. Sure. You know, it, it, uh, it, it certainly starts with, you know, you asked the question earlier about, do you get some friction and, you know, one of my jobs early on, if I'm doing like, I'm going to call it like a session or a program with people is to, you know, I always say when people show up to any kind of a training, a session, there's always three people there. There's the people that are, they're excited to be there. You know, it's kind of the 10, 80, 10 rule. There's some excited, then there's some in the middle that are kind of like, yeah, let's see how this goes. Let's see what this is about. And they're kind of moving up and down the spectrum. And then there's that, you know, the, the, the 10% that absolutely positively don't want to be there at all. Right. And so, so, so my job early on is to, is to as much as I can move that 10% out of that, out of that, uh, that kind of fear place that they don't want to be there. So that's, that's the first thing. So, you know, how do I do that? Um, it, it's through, it's through different activities for different conversations. I mean, it, anything I do is pretty active based. It's not a lot of, I guess what I call lecturing. It's not a lot of sitting and listening, but at the same time, I don't want to do, you know, we, we talked earlier about this whole team building thing. I'm going to kind of branch off onto something else here, but somebody was asking me recently, we were talking about like the components of like what, what what groups do it for team building, right? People building. And we said, well, there's there's kind of like you said, there's the trust falls and that kind of thing, right? We go out, we do activity, we learn about each other, great. Or or you could even say we get together in a room and we build things out of Legos and then we talk about how we communicated and okay, so that that's one way to do it. Sure. And then I think another way to do it falls under I mean, whether it's, you know, Myers-Briggs or Briggs-Myers, whatever it's called, or the DISC profile, you know, there's all these things out there that are about our personalities and, you know, how we interact with each other, which is all really good information, really, really powerful to learn. And then I said, uh, you know, I said, I think more what I do is kind of the third arm of that, which is what I call relationship development, which is actually giving people a chance just to get to know each other. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but I know me personally, I've got a lot more, I want to know a lot more about you when I know you as a person. And then we can move on to the other stuff. Yeah. But that's the kind of understanding people's stories and where they're coming from and knowing that there's always a reason to, that people do things. So I guess that's a really long answer to your short question. But, yeah, it's, it's a lot of act, it's activity type stuff. And it gets them up and speaking, which goes back to this whole number one fear. When we get up and we talk, all of a sudden we start to be a little more comfortable when we, when we get through that fear. Because if we can do that, we can do just about anything. Yeah. And, and when you t start talking Myers-Briggs and all these different things, the reason I'm asking is because I think a lot of people – yeah, so-called team building coaches or whatever, a lot of times they, I don't know why I put that in quotes, a lot of times they, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah they, they can say something and people can intellectually know that, right? But yes. actually understanding and actually applying it to life, that's much more difficult. No, no question. I mean, there's, you know, one of my, one of, I mean, one of my favorite people that I've, I've been to see him live and I read a lot of this stuff is Anthony Robbins. And, you know, he, you know, there's, there's some people love him to death and some people I think because he's so over the top that like it freaks him out. Sure. And what I always tell people about him is I'm like, look at, take all that out of the equation. He's a phenomenal teacher, in my opinion. I mean, he does just what you said. He can take this concept and then break it down into a tangible thing that somebody can actually do. Mm. You know, some kind of a personal development thing, whatever it is. So, um, but yeah, you're exactly right. You, you got to move it into a thing they're actually up and doing and experiencing rather than just sitting there and talking about it. Yeah. So how did you get involved in wanting to do this in the first place? You know, I, uh, my first thing was, it was kind of twofold. Um, I went through some of my own kind of personal growth in my life when I was about 26, 27 years old and had a, you know, I had my first kind of significant relationship that didn't go great. I actually went started seeing a counselor and, and really what that brought in was this, this whole concept of just self-learning and self-growth, which I'd never, you know, in 25, 26 years, had never been exposed to anything like that. So that was a, it was a paradigm shift, mm -hmm. you know, sudden, wow, like this is all kind of me. Yeah. It's unfortunate how that gets stigmatized just to yeah. people. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, you mentioned going to a counselor, talking to a therapist and everybody's like, you know, <laughs> moving for the exit doors right. um, as quick as they can. There's a, a good friend of mine who's a major league manager. He was telling me that, you know, a lot of these teams nowadays have a sports psychologist or somebody on staff. And he's like, 
And he's like, it's such a bummer. Just what you said, it's this great position. This could be super helpful, but the stigma is there's something wrong with me. You know, why can't I go figure this crap out on my own? Why do I need to go get help? You know, and then asking for help is being vulnerable. And it's this downward cycle that people don't do it. Yeah. It's interesting because I personally come from a uh, special operations background. So uh, I would say we operate at a very high level, uh, you know, at a very high team level. Um, sure. But still, like people are so uh, when you when you bring up professional development or, or I guess maybe like personal development, people mm-hmm. get really like really uh, skittish around that and wanting to do it. Well, yeah, then, then all of a sudden, you know, you go back to what we do. I mean, and really the whole, this whole team building thing, I mean, if there's anything we really do, it's really people building. And because we do it at the same time, it becomes team building. Mm. You know, that's really where the team building happens. Whereas, you know, where it's not, you know, the, the exercises or things like that, it's, it's the role doing this kind of personal growth. But yeah, you're right. It's got a, whatever you want to call it, a, you know, sounds kind of touchy feely, sounds scary, sounds, you know, pretty, it, it's uncomfortable. Bottom line, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, for sure. So the the last time that we are going to do one of these interviews, I think uh, you had to fly out to Michigan. Yes. So when a team when you when you do that, what uh, what exactly are you doing for them? It, and, it, and it varies depending on. Usually, I'll go in with with the specifically the sports teams. Um, you know, two and three times a year. Um, usually, a coach will have me come in early in the season, and that one's that one's all about like developing the culture and you know, kind of helping them define like who they want to be as a team and, and who they want to be as individuals. And so there's that part. And then usually the second couple are more follow-ups. They're just, um, you know, kind of reminders of some of the stuff that we talked about. They're, they're much shorter sessions. I mean, those first ones are, you know, maybe over a two or three day span. I'll probably spend up to like 10, eight, 10 hours with the team, you know, broken down in small chunks. And then, and then these follow-up ones are definitely shorter ones. So it's, you know, you know, maybe, maybe an hour, it could be an hour, two hours, three hours, it could even be 30 minutes. You know, we might just do some little quick thing that anchors in something we did before and then, you know, kind of just gets them ready because they're in the middle of the season. They don't have a lot of, they don't have a lot of extra time, put it that way. Yeah, for sure. And I saw, uh, I guess it, it would be out of competition, but you only work with one team per conference or something like that I saw. Yeah, that's exactly. We just, some we just kind of came up with, I can, we came up with internally of, of realizing that, you know, these these, these coaches and players are kind of letting us into their world. You know, I always talk about the, when I get to go into a locker room, you know, I, I consider it, I consider it a very sacred space. Yeah. You know, it's kind of one of those places not everybody, no, nobody else knows what goes on in there and, and to get a little snapshot into there. And I just know that, you know, no matter how fantastic these athletes or coaches thought this was, if the next week, you know, using Michigan as an example, if the very next weekend I was going to be in East Lansing with Michigan state, probably don't get quite the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. You know, I, just, I just know me as an athlete, as competitive as I was. I mean, I'd be like, that was awesome. But then if I knew that, like, yeah, that, that would, you know, there's just, it's, it, we're competitive, man. <laughs> yeah, that would definitely diminish your, your thought process on the effectiveness. <laughs> yeah, you know, also, and I just, I never wanted to be a, a consultant that went around and worked with anybody. I mean, it's got to be a really, really good fit. And, you know, some of these coaches that I've gotten to know, um, I essentially give, give me almost like keys to the place and I get to go in and you know, I get to watch them in their coach meetings and they'll listen to them breaking down strategies and X's and O's. And, you know, that's kind of the agreement is I'm not going to, I'm not going to take any of that internal information and share it, you know, with anybody else. That's their stuff they're working on. And, you know, I might help them fine tune it, but, you know, and in terms of, you know, cause a lot of that stuff is at that level, it's, it's pretty competitive. Sure. So when you're improving upon an organization, what sort of methodologies or frame of references are you teaching from? If I, if I understand the question right, you know, and this is such a buzzword these days, but this whole kind of culture building, you know, kind of what do we stand for around here? Mm-hmm. So, so, but methodologies I would use, so, and that's really the, the core of it is, is culture building. And then the methodology would be, you know, just the real simple, you know, where are we at and where are we going and what's it going to take to get there? And where they're kind of developing their own roadmap of, you know, what are things they can do back to your thing, like some actual tangible things they can do on a day-to-day basis to actually kind of support and uphold that so that if, you know, whether it's a, a recruit coming into one of these organizations or whether it's a company or, you know, I do a lot of work at schools, um, you know, so when you walk in there, culture is a thing that you feel. You know, I, I, I got to believe not being an armed forces person, but in special ops, I mean, there was a culture around there. You know, you based on the behavior and the way people did things. Sure. You know, it was very, very clear and very defined. And when somebody was outside of that, it didn't, it didn't fit well. Right. So you mentioned, what are those actual things though, that you're doing, I guess, to really improve upon culture? Cause that is kind of a buzzword. I'm, I'm curious, like when you're working with an organization or if, if people are listening to this and they are currently working in an organization, which all of sure. us obviously are, like, what are those like tangible things? Like 
that you're going to actually do to kind of help? And let me let me ask this. So when you when you're asked that, like, what are like some of the actual processes I use with them? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sure. Um, I, you know, in in terms of the culture stuff, um, I, you know, I wouldn't say that's anything that's it's any it's it's really just divided about conversations. I mean, really just getting people. You know, I'm kind of facilitating them, but I'm kind of leading them through you know a series of processes in terms of it, that is nothing more than just discussions. You know, they're kind of getting a chance to sit and, you know, it's, it's the, I'll use the catchphrase, do it by design and not by default. So getting really, really clear with it, but it's, it's really nothing more than me sitting with the coaches in a room for, you know, for as long as the brain can take it. I mean, I was with Arizona baseball last summer, so I went in with the coaches and, you know, spent, spent like three hours one day and then, you know, we, but it's about turning the cell phones off. So it's not so much about like what I'm doing with them, probably it's kind of like how we do it, okay. if that makes sense. Um, but it really was nothing more than just sitting in a room with a whiteboard and, you know, some, you know, and then mixing in some little activities and stuff to keep the energy going. But it, it really was just a lot of just conversations and giving them a chance to just focus on, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the uh, I guess the culture that they want to continue to create. And it would be no different than what a business, I mean, if you were to, if you were to compare it to a business world and, you know, I probably do 20% of the stuff I do is within, you know, kind of in the corporate world, it's, it's kind of just a high level strategic plan. And just saying, okay, where are we at right now? What do we want to do moving forward? But just giving them a chance to talk in there. So I don't, I don't know if that's really answering your question, but it, it really is nothing more than that. Yeah. So I, I mean, I would imagine when you're working with an organization and you're working through something like culture, there's a certain amount of finesse that just has to be kind of pushed into there that, that you would probably have. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly hope so. I mean, yeah, yeah. that's that is definitely my job is to is to facilitate it, keep it going, um, you know, and and bring in, you know. It, any bring into the discussion just to really get them thinking about you know what they want moving forward in terms of how to be the best whether it's breaking down how they recruit how they you know how they evaluate players how you know they're putting their practice plans I mean all that kind of stuff and it would be the same in the corporate world I mean how they you know just de defining you know what matters and what kind of people they're after and you know all those kind of things that again if you don't if you don't really get clear on how you want it'll, it'll happen you know it's it's going to happen over time it's just are you going to you know really get clear on what you want. Yeah, and with a sports team, you have essentially a very short amount of time to get your shit together, right? Absolutely, you know. There's it's it's quick. I mean, there's I mean, there's no there's no downtime for these guys at all. You know, no none whatsoever. Yeah, and when you're talking, you're talking college sports, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I do a little bit in the high school world, but it's yeah, but ninety ninety five percent of it is is both men and women's um, pretty high level college sports teams. Okay. Yeah. So when you're talking a school level sports team. You're talking uh, new people too every year. Yeah, I, was, I then you know that even adds to it. We were I was talking to a coach and he said, you know, you, let's take high school, let's take college baseball. They carry roughly 36 people. Well, every year there's about 15 new ones. I mean, if you were to if you had a company that turned over, you know, 40 percent of its employees every year, you'd be thinking, what the hell's the matter with this company? But it's just part of the nature. So yeah, so keeping that that culture wheel, you know, spinning in the right direction is you know really really important. Yeah, so that's interesting because that's something I always think about when I when you see a an organization, a sports team like in the NCAA that's successful for many years, like more than mm -hmm. four years. You're like, what what are they doing? And I think, that, you know what I mean. It's got to come down to coaching. It's got to come down to culture, and it's got to come down to people being able to assimilate to that culture rather quickly. I would imagine. No, no question. I think one of the things that all these coaches want, and you know, that they're looking to develop is kind of a, a players holding each other accountable. Um, you know, that's a, that's kind of a big, uh, element, I guess, or a foundational piece that I definitely hear from all the coaches. How do we get these guys to hold each other in the locker room? I just saw recently, I think it was on, I don't know if it was on Twitter or where it was, but it was, they were talking about the Alabama football program. And one of the assistant coaches said he knew, he knew the culture because you just, you were talking about success over a, over a, you know, long period of time, which they're, they're pretty successful recently, uh, yeah. there at Alabama. And, uh, Right. But he, he talked about how he said, I knew the culture really shifted when he said he walked into the weight room and he heard, overheard one of the players say to another player, that's not how we do things around here. And he said, that's kind of trick that, 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 that the players were getting it. They were taking that on themselves um, to hold each other accountable so the coaches don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's something also too, uh, even from a uh, professional sports level that I've always looked at, like within, like, let's call it the New England Patriots, right? For sure. To be successful for that amount of time, there has to be such a hard, fast culture in there that, that people just either get or don't. And I think you read that a little bit, but. 
I'm no, just speculating. I, no, I, I would I would say you're spot on. I was just uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the book Ego is the Enemy. You know, that's one that's come across your list lately. Anyway, it's got a guy named Ryan Holiday. He also did that. The Obstacle is the Way. Um, pretty 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 popular books in, in recent memory. But anyways, in the in Ego is the Enemy, there's a story about the New England Patriots, and it and it talks about, of course, the you know the infamous draft pick, which most people say is the greatest pick in the history of the NFL. Uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Brady. But what was what I found fascinating about it was that it talked about, you know, how the, how the media, you know, proclaims that best pick ever, blah, 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 blah. But the culture in the Patriots organization was that, you know, number one, they make the pick in the drafts in April. And then, of course, they go through the next season. He doesn't play at all. And the next season's when, you know, Bledsoe gets hurt. Brady comes in and plays. And they kind of realize what they have. And rather than getting all caught up and patting themselves on the back in terms of, hey, look how awesome we are. Their first question internally, back to what kind of culture they have, was how did we miss that badly? How did we think a guy that we took in the sixth round that's this good? Like, what's the matter with our player personnel scouting? How did we miss that badly? Right. Okay. Rather than getting all caught up in what everybody else was all caught up in, and you know, which again goes back to cultures. How do we get a little bit better? You know, so they just like went and kind of tore the whole thing apart, and we're like, we can't ever miss like that again. As a matter of fact, there's a, a great part of the story that talks about uh, Scott Pioli. He was the uh, like the director of player personnel for the Patriots, and after that, he used to. He's not with the Patriots anymore, but he used to keep a picture of a player on his desk. And I think a lot of people think, well, of course, it was Brady, right? Greatest pick ever. And it was a guy named Dave Stachelski or something like that. And everybody like, who the hell's Dave Stachelski? Well, he was the guy they drafted in the fifth round. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. it was kind of a reminder to him of, hey, you know, you're 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 this close to success, but you're this close to failure at any moment, and you better remember to, you know, stay hungry and stay humble and you know, it's just kind of a reminder to himself of, you know, hey, this is this is how close you were to, to missing out. Yeah, and and you see a lot of times it, and I don't know if it's Belichick making the call or whatever, but you'll they'll take players that are seemingly average on other teams, but they fit that culture piece so well that then they mm-hmm. become really successful. And I think you even see those players now taking pay cuts to stay part of that successful culture, just because I feel like people are starting to know what they have. No, I I agree with you 100. percent When you got guys wanting to play there, I mean now you've you know and when you let's let's kind of umbrella that back into some of the stuff we've talking about, whether that's a a company or a college sports team or a pro sports team, when you got people that want to be there, you know you're 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 all of a sudden kind of you're 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 in the right direction, put it that way. Yeah, for sure. So I'll ask you one more question and we'll move on from the Patriots. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I've just, I'm curious because I've been looking at it from an outside standpoint for so long. Do you think that it, obviously culture's top down, I think, uh, at least in my speculation. Do you think it's coming all the way from Kraft? Do you think he's the greatest organizational owner? Or do you think it's Belichick? Or do you, you know what I'm saying? Good question. I, I, I got to believe that somewhere in there, Kraft's a smart enough guy to get the right people and then get out of their way and let them do their thing. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's what it looks like from the outside standpoint. Um, and then he goes and gets people, but then lets the hey, here's which I think great leaders do. They they know their skill sets, and then they find other people that do you know those other things well. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's I, it, I guess ultimately starts with 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 him and making those kind of decisions yeah. in terms of people. But then you know getting you know getting the right people in there too. Um, you know because you you know Bill Belichick certainly doesn't strike anybody you know in terms of his the way he. Uh, Peers, his appearance, you know, my appearance, I don't mean just the way he looks, I just mean the way he talks, everything. Yeah. He's not strikes you as like some, you know, charismatic leader, which a lot of times, you know, that people think you got to be that to be great at something. It's like, no, that guy just, you know, he, he does the little things and he, you know, he was the guy that decided I'm going to be better at film than anybody else ever was. And, you know, that was that thing that nobody liked to do was review film. He was like, I'm going to be really good at it and I'm going to love it. And, you know, Brady, Brady, I've read the same stuff about Brady. He was kind of the same guy. He just, he just studies it harder than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to, you know, looking at the broader picture, when you look at organizations, something I would say, even like from an entrepreneurial standpoint, something really successful entrepreneurs do is that they surround themselves with the right people all the time. And I would say that's probably even a better skill than being, having a hard skill yourself. Uh, Absolutely. It's almost that in, in a way, it's a little bit of being vulnerable, meaning that I, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> you know, I, I maybe don't know how to do this thing the best, but I can find the right people that can do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that, you know, for, 
because you, you, how many, how many organizations, since we're just talking NFL, how many NFL organizations have gone through a thing where a couple egos got in the room and blew the thing up because they couldn't get along? Yeah. You know, the, the San Francisco 49ers had a pretty good thing going a few years ago. And then you had an, an owner with an, or an owner, a GM, I think it was the GM that had a big ego. And of course, Harbaugh's got a big, big ego, but they were winning. And I promise you the 49er fans right now would, would gladly take Harbaugh. Yeah. <laughs> If they were if they were still winning, I think they take uh, Alex Smith too. <laughs> oh yeah, you think? <laughs> yeah, they'd be very very happy to have that guy back. Yeah. So uh, when you when you're talking about like knowing yourself and being vulnerable, this ties into the next question that I had, which is yeah. how do you think being self aware contributes to your success? Because that's something I see you talk about a little bit on your website. Yeah. Um. I, you know, I I'll steal from a. I, I claim this quote. I don't know if anybody else ever said it because now it's really hard these days to track down who actually said something. <laughs> right, right. It's damn near impossible to figure it out. Gandhi said it. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, but I do have a belief that says, and it's really this thing that, that, that you can't lead other people until you can lead yourself, and you can't lead yourself until you can know yourself. And when I, you know, this kind of goes back to something we, we talked about very early that once I started to get a little bit of, insight into this awareness of me and I realized what it did for me kind of just being aware of myself what makes me tick what I like what I don't like what I'm good at what I'm not good at it opened up this whole it opened up like a whole new world I don't know if that makes sense I know that's being very you know uh, I don't know what the right word for it is but well it's like esoteric but you're seeing yourself for the first time right in a different lens thank you yeah that's exactly what it is and so that was such I think for me um, it, it was such a powerful thing for me that it, it's kind of it kind of starts to become everything that I speak about. I mean, anything that I go and talk to a group about whether it's going and doing a keynote, you know, for, for an hour, for, for whatever, for a company or an organization or whether it's doing one of these trainings, like we're talking about to get with some people for two or three hours. I mean, a lot of that comes out because I think that's a, another one of those kind of like foundational pieces that the more aware people are, the more aware I am of myself. It, it just, it, it influences everything that we do, every decision that we make, every, Every behavior that we have kind of starts with that self-awareness of ourself and of myself. Yeah, you definitely, in order to get anywhere, right, you need to know where you are currently. Yeah, and, and sometimes that takes, you know, being like brutally honest, you know, I mean, yeah. really, really honest with ourselves about, you know, again, when I think about, you know, I, th- I just, what, what I love about this show, I mean, I went and listened to, you know, several of the episodes so far, and what I heard in there, a ton of it was, it's kind of the success leaves clues, and when I listen to successful people, that's that's one of those foundational things. They seem pretty self-aware of themselves, and and aren't afraid to like ask the tough questions and face the tough questions, and and, and that helps them grow. That's that seems to be a, a foundational element. At least a lot of people that I consider successful people. Yeah, without a doubt. Something I've seen in the past is like I would say one of the most crippling things toward success is having like an entitlement mentality, feeling like maybe somebody owes you something. Sure. And if you have, if you have, if you're not self-aware, it's very easy to develop that mentality. Good. Yeah, that's a great point. And you, you know, you, you, you see that a lot, you know, where they, where they all of a sudden this is owed to me or somebody should have done this for me or, you know, this thing should have happened. And, you know, rather than saying, Hey man, you know, what, what could I have done about that? I mean, my, <laughs> I was talking to my, my grandpa, you know, he kind of, kind of understands what I do. He's 87 years old and he used to work for the, for the telephone company forever. And, and he gave me kind of an analogy. He said, you know, whenever, if somebody got in an accident, he said, no matter what, the, no matter, you know, because you come out, whose fault was it? Well, it was somebody else's fault. And then, but they literally like broke it down to, but what could you have done to it? Even if it wasn't your fault, mm-hmm. what could you have done to avoid the accident? You know, and he, even to the point where he said a guy one time was parked and, and, a, and he was inside doing something and a guy came around the corner, was icy and slid his car and, and hit the car. And the guy's like, what do you mean? What else could I have done? And they're like, well, if you looked at the corner, you realize there was ice. Maybe you wouldn't have parked there. You know what I mean? Like yeah. really thinking down to that detail that there's always something else that, that the person could have done. Yeah, I think people by and large don't like to face that fact because it's scary. <laughs> it's very scary. I mean right. it it goes back to that one of my favorite of all time TED Talks is the one by Brene Brown um, on vulnerability. And she, you know, she talks about, um, you know, in, in her mind she uses the term people who live wholeheartedly and who kind of embrace vulnerability. I mean, you know, again, you talk about things that are that terrify people, being vulnerable would be right up there on the list. I mean, you know, even that word for most people, you mention it in the room and you just watch everybody go, ah, yeah, I don't know about this. Mm-hmm. But, but again, I mean, you know, people, I, I, I talk to athletes about it all the time and, 
you know, because in, in sports so much of it's like, you know, hey, man, we got to go and we got to put that that tough, confident face on, even if we're not feeling it. And yet I talk to him like at the same time, though, when you go ask your coach for help or in a business setting, if you go ask your boss for help, that's being vulnerable. Like yeah. kind of and saying, hey, man, I, I don't know what to do. I'm stuck. What kind of, you know, can I get some help? Um, all tough questions to ask. Yeah. But be really, really beneficial, too. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people that listen to this, I think probably because uh, once you get to be an adult, it's a lot harder to compete in a team sport. So I think a lot of people are probably more like individual competitors, like sure. CrossFit, runners, powerlifters, whatever. And when you start, own, like you have to own the blame too, right? And I think that's what really starts to scare people is it, anything that happens that's good is going to be on your shoulders. But when you have to be really honest with yourself, that means you've also <laughs> got to own, own the stuff you fucked up. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, that's, again, man, I, you know, you, we were talking about people that, people that I consider successful. And that'd be another one of those, man. It's those type of people are like, Hey man, I, I blew it. I own it. No excuse, no story, no justification. You know, my, my poor kids are getting raised in that world of, I mean, just say, I'm sorry. And we're done. Like, that's all I need to hear, but let's not do a story and some lame, you know, reason about why it happened. Just here's what happened. I blew it. Yeah. Yeah. Own it and, and move on. And those people are typically successful in the workplace too. Yeah, it, absolutely. I mean, you can start to see the translations. I mean, I don't know where I got this phrase, but it's a great question. It's where else in your life does that show up? You know, because because people that were doing it at, at 20 are probably still doing it if, you know, because one of two things happen to they continue the pattern or, you know, life will come along and freaking throw a haymaker at you. And, and you're like, damn, I probably should pay attention to that behavior, that habit that I've got going now. Yeah, and that's interesting because I think a lot of people, when they're talking about the generation that's growing up right now, they talk <laughs> a lot about uh, the entitlement mentality and stuff like that. And it's it's kind of weird because it's like, are you trying to, do we want to prepare the world for the kid or the kid for the world, right? Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. That's a, yeah, the, the, that's a great, I haven't heard it that way before, but you're exactly right. You're, you're exactly right. It seems you know, like and, we're trying to prepare the world for the kid a lot more these days. Yes, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and so, yeah, no, you, you, you make a really, really uh, a good point. But that's one of the reasons that I, I love sport in general, whether it's fitness or whether it's team sports, is like there's so much translation to, to regular life like you just – like you mentioned. Yeah, they're all, there's always that, that, that correlation there. I mean why do people, why do people continue? I, my, my son's in a – my three-year-old son's in a, this little ninja class and there's, there's a couple people that are in there and they're, that you can tell they're into – I've heard them talking, they're into CrossFit and body, you know, training and things like that. And it's like, why? Because that competitive, <laughs> those little competitive juices, like, it's not like they go away. Right. You know, we're, we're still, you know, competitive. So now how do, how do we do it in another element, you know? And some people do it in the business world and some, but it's all, you know, all those behaviors and stuff, you know, show up in other places. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely can learn some life lessons on the field for sure. Right. <laughs> right. So what is the uncommon oath? I saw that on your on your website <laughs> the uncommon oath so um the, the the what it is the real simple answer is that it's with with some of the sports teams we work with we've only done that in the sports arena but kind of back to the um you hear a lot of coaches say you know you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable and you know you asked you alluded to this earlier okay so we've talked about this and i hear but so how do we how do we actually do that thing so this is one of the processes that we use where they are given it's a, it's a hundred and I think it's like 150 words or something like that. And it's a phrase and it talks about kind of their commitment to the team and, and, and they have to memorize it. And but that's really all they know till we get there. And, and then kind of one of the, the way the the event, I guess, or the program finishes up is that each one of the players gets up in front of his whole team and delivers that. But not only do they have to deliver the words, they've got to deliver it with what we call level 10 passion and energy, which means like putting every, so it's like just, it's just like total like out of body experience, you know, but, and, and a lot of people, you know, I don't know where you saw it or read that, but it's kind of why some of that stuff doesn't make it to, to video or on my website. Cause people see that and they think, oh, this is one of those like rah, rah motivational things. And it's like, that's like the, the last thing that that's about. I mean, it's about getting out of our comfort zone and allowing our team to support us and giving that everything that we've got to something, which again, that thing that we were just talking about, I mean, every one of those is a life behavior that I think successful people have. 
Yeah. You know, people give everything to things. Sex people get out of their comfort zone. Successful people allow other people to support them. You know what I mean? So it, it but that's what it's about. But it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a crazy intense, like kind of over the top process that. <laughs> okay. So you use it as a tool to like foster all these other characteristics, essentially. Absolutely. Yeah. It's something that they, it's, it's kind of part of what they do. Several of the teams, um, you know, one of the teams we've got, I mean, they've got like the actual words mounted on the wall and it's, it's kind of part of the culture. Like this is how we do things around here. One of the, one of the phrases that it is putting the needs of the team above my own, which is really, really tough, you know, and, and again, not just in a sports setting, in a professional setting, you know, you, you think about things that go on in a, in a company or a business. And a lot of times it's because somebody's being selfish. Somebody's really putting their own needs above the bigger picture. So I'd imagine teams want to retain you then for another year, huh? So they don't have that plastered <laughs> on another wall. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, we're always, like I said, we're, you know, back, whether it's the sports teams or the companies, I mean, it, you know, we always say to them too, that this isn't some, this isn't some like quick fix thing where we're going to come in and do something. And then, you know, cause we don't want it to be, Hey, some cool thing we did last year or some cool thing we did that one day. You know, and I, I say the same things to companies, um, you know, don't, don't look at it as a one-time thing. You got to kind of, you got to repeat it every so often or else it will just be a one-time thing. Yeah, for sure. So I have a question for you because this is something that takes you a while to instill in an organization. A lot of times as an adult, we, when we're I'll, I'll relate it to CrossFit. So when I started competing yeah. in CrossFit, I was instantly on a CrossFit team, right? Okay. Um, so if you're put in a team environment and you want to lead them to be successful with little time, what mm-hmm. are some of the things that you can, can do essentially to try to try to build that quicker when you don't get to know them, for example, or when you have like, eight weeks to train or, or something like that. Sure. So are you asking like, if I go in and you, if I go in and actually work with a team, is that what you're saying? Like, what would I do if I had a shorter? Sure. Like if you were going to put, be put in that uh, position, just because I'm thinking people are, that are listening to this, that, that compete in more of like the adult uh, sports mm-hmm. leagues types things, they have shorter amount of time, but they still want to be a leader. They still want to do the right thing by their team. Yeah. I, I think if I'm, if, if I'm hearing the question, right, I'm going to go back to the thing that we talked about. I mean, kind of what, in any of those group environment like that would be go back to the relationship development because I'm also a big believer that when people feel like when people feel like they can actually like truly be themselves, we tend to perform a lot better at whatever that is, whether it's CrossFit, whether it's being in the business, whether it's on a college sports team, when we can really feel comfortable with who we are. And a lot of people don't fully feel comfortable with who they are. Sure. At, at various levels. You know, I mean, you, you, you walk in, let's, okay, let's take this CrossFit. So you walk into this team. I, let me ask you a question. So how many people are on the CrossFit team that you were talking about roughly? Six, three guys, okay, three so girls. It, yes, it's a smaller team. So, so in that setting, cause now we've got our own, whether it's, is this person better than I am at this thing? Or, you know, I mean, our, our, the self-talk gets going and all the internal BS gets going. And so now we're not really being ourselves. So, so if I had, if you said, Hey, what would you do for a short time? I would come in and focus on simply the relationship development so people can feel comfortable being themselves because that, that plays such a big role in how we perform at things when we feel truly comfortable being ourselves. Yeah, sure. What are some of your thoughts on leadership like within the team environment? Well, that's a good question. So like success, I think leadership is a very abstract thing that's hard to kind of put terms on. Yes. So I, in the, I, I would, I'll, I'll start here anyway. So in the, in let's, let's, let's use just cause we're talking sports right now and then we'll, We'll maybe elaborate into other areas, but what I see with a ton of athletes is it's it's easier to find the athletes that are what I call kind of the by example type person. In other words, they will go and they will do the thing and they will work hard at it and they'll be good in the weight room or whatever. That's not that when I say easier to find, I'm not saying that it's not really, really important or that it's not tough to be that person, but on the global scale, that person's easier to find. Then there's the other spectrum of what I call kind of the more vocal leader. The person that will actually say something that will actually kind of call people out that will hold people accountable. And, you know, and there's some certain like little kind of caveats that got to go in there. I mean, you know, if you're going to be one of the better athletes, the better workers on the team, then actually, you know, actually use your voice. So that's the harder one to find. But I think in terms of a setting, it's really, really important. I think the best kind of leaders, whether it's of a company or a sports team, they can kind of do both. You know, they're, they're not only the hardest worker, but they're also not afraid to say something when it's actually when it's actually needed to hold people accountable, which, you know, again, that's scary because it's that what if people don't like me? What if people don't like what I have to say? What if they don't, you know, you're dealing with all that as well. But that's a that's a really, really important part. If, if that 
you know, that's kind of the shorter answer, but in terms of those two components are really important. Yeah, sure. And I kind of, I like the common themes that we're kind of like pulling up here when it comes to success, like accountability, right? Like whether that's yourself or your team, like holding yourself accountable again, that's something very hard to do, but definitely uh, common among successful people. <laughs> yeah, very, very common. So we, you know, one of the, so even given a, a, a specific one, whether it's a company or a group, um, sometimes we'll take them through like we call a feedback process and we'll, we'll literally allow them to, to give both, you know, both positive feedback and we like to call it feedback for improvement um, and kind of teach them a language and a way to say it um, so that it doesn't become a personal attack. Um, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, we've all been a part of a conversation that didn't go all that well when somebody was giving, you know, usually it's feedback for improvement right, right. Um, into kind of a mess. Um, so we wanted to give them kind of an avenue on there and kind of teach them, hey, here's a, here's a way to do it, talking about the behavior, talking about the impact, here's a suggestion. And so there's actually a communication taking place um, between people, which, you know, that starts to, you know, kind of build on the, um, if, you, if you've read the Patrick Lencioni, he's got the book about the five dysfunctions of a team. And he, you know, talks about that foundational level is the trust. I mean, which I know, again, that's one of those words that gets thrown out there. But, you know, at that bottom level, if there's not some trust there. You, basically, what you get is kind of this false um, you get, it's a false connection. People don't really connect, and then you can't even move up to the next levels until that's actually built. Hmm. Do you think that leaders are born or made? I think it's honestly, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think some people have certainly have some skill sets that just kind of come through life's experiences, you know, things that they've done, things they've experienced as they're growing up. But then I do think there can be some things that can be, you know, trained on and taught to and worked on if if a person really commits to it. I mean. Uh, you know, this, this leadership thing is one of the things everybody, you know, at least I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people say, hey, I want to be a leader of this or of that or on top of it. And then they get there and it's like, wow, this is a lot of freaking hard work. Yeah. You know, this, this is a really tough thing to do. It's not, it's not easy. So yeah, I, I would say it's, it, it can be a little bit of both. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think that's really what would start separating people is once you sit, once people start getting exposed to the actual amount of work that it takes to be good at something. And I don't mean just reps, I mean, focused reps. Um, you start separating the, the bingo. Yeah, it is the you know it is the great the whole uh, the whole ten thousand hours thing. Well, <laughs> your ten thousand hours might look a lot different than my ten thousand hours if if I'm unfocused and you're focused. And you know, there's then also there's a great separation there. So you know, the the time of experience and like you said, how you actually do it is is paramount. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen it to m myself with with different things that I've started doing, and I like the. Uh, you'll find out quickly whether you like the idea of something, or you actually, or that thing actually resonates with you when you have to yeah. start putting in the real work requ required. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like starting to uh, start like a CrossFit program or something like that. Pretty quickly, like, do I like this? Do I like to go do this thing, or do I like the idea right. of doing this thing? <laughs> yeah, the big one you see a lot, and we've talked about it on the show, but it's like people, when you get involved in CrossFit, to get involved, there's a low barrier of entry, right, as there should be. But to go to the CrossFit Games, right, that, those are very different. Although you can sign up to try, the barrier <laughs> to entry is low. When people start getting into that, like, six hours in the gym and you start, like, sacrificing friends and all of these different things, it's like, okay, shit, no, I'm trying to be a pro athlete right now, and that's a very Absolutely. big difference. Yeah, I can see that being a, a huge dose of uh, uh, delayed gratitude. Yeah, which is uh, you know, like let's let's put all that aside for this thing I want at the end. You know, you we were talking earlier about kind of this this generation, I guess, that's coming up, and I think that's one of the that's one of the biggest things they struggle with is is you know they they've been brought up in a world of everything's right now. I can have it right this second. You know, mm -hmm. whatever I want to eat, I I don't have to wait for anything to pay for it. I can put on a credit card. I mean. You know the, the the lifestyle that they've been thrown into is and it, and and honestly I, I don't I'm a, I personally I don't think it's their fault I mean it's just kind of this you know until we it's not just because of kind of the way the world is right now and I don't want to blame the world or anything like that but they've got some things to overcome to understand that yeah for sure I mean that's that's like when you look at childhood obesity or anything right they're just living in the world that we created essentially absolutely yeah absolutely and, and a lot of it was like stuff that was well intended. It just didn't have the the long term impact that we hoped that it would. Right, and that's part of the problem with you know consumer culture and capitalism, and you know for all the great things, like there's the side where it's like if you just gobble everything up with reckless abandon, you're probably not going to like where you end up. Bingo, right? And all of a sudden, you just end up there. You didn't plan it. You didn't want to be there. You just oh crap, how did I get here? Right. Are you familiar with uh, the marshmallow test? Um. Yes, with the little the little kids. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. 
that's 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 exactly the what they're dealing with. Right. So, have you seen the teams that you work with that are more successful? Do they have, I guess, like a propensity to delay gratification more? I, absolutely. Um, you know, they. One of the things too that I've seen them do that becomes such a big, big thing, and it kind of goes along with this, is their ability to approach every day the same. And and I know that sounds kind of, you know, kind of cliche, but meaning win, lose, it, you know, however they played or performed the day before, the next day they look the same. Right. You know, when I if I'm if I'm down there watching them play or whatever, and if I see them go through a tough loss the night before, and then I'll watch them the next day, and I'm like. Can you tell that they had a tough loss the night before? And not that we shouldn't, you know, not that that shouldn't eat at us a little bit and drive us the next day, but in general, kind of show up so that it, it looks the same every day, or else you, you know, because they're they're kind of trying to avoid all, avoid all these highs and lows, and you know, kind of stay in this like just main this main thing, which again, um, like you said, whether it's whether it's getting ready to prepare for a CrossFit thing or whether it's getting ready to prepare for a day at work, I kind of want to be in that same ready to go kind of routine mindset. So, yeah, so no doubt about it. And it becomes part of their, you know, the other thing from these athletes that I think, you know, they take into life that's so important is kind of having routines and, and whether you're on routines, rituals, ways of going through things, ways to get themselves in the right mindset, ways to get themselves set to do something. I mean, that stuff is 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 so, so critical. Mm. Um, you think about going and doing it. I, mean, I, I would almost guarantee it if you start breaking it down and talking to CrossFit competitors and you start talking about like what they really did to prepare themselves mentally for that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's something they've been doing for a long time. It became a routine. It's no different than watching a batter step into the batter's box. And they got this little three-second routine they got to get themselves, you know, ready and focused. Yeah. Do you think being um, very succinct with what your, I guess, your why, right, or your purpose is uh, kind of helps with that mental piece? A- absolutely. Um, you know, having a, yeah, it really is that that, that little phrase of knowing when we, when we know the why, we can figure out the how, you know, to have a, but it's got to be, it's got to be that kind of internal driving you know, driving force there. And the other one I see them do that I think the best, uh, you know, athletes to get the most out of it too, are, you know, a lot of people have a routine for getting ready to do the thing. What I don't see a lot of is people creating a routine that when, when shit goes sideways, what's my routine to get back to that good mindset? Mm-hmm. You know, they spend the time building the routine to get, to get ready for the thing. But then when, you know, they, everything goes, you know, not the way we wanted it to go. Now what do I do? Well, you got to have that bookend at that side of it too to, to get yourself back there, whether it's what the self talk, what you think about. I mean, all that kind of stuff becomes really, really important too because, you know, again, using the, whether it's the CrossFit thing, whether it's an athletic performance or it's in business, stuff's going to go terrible. Right. So, what would that look like? What, what do you mean by a routine to get back into the, the swing of things? Perfect. So, um, well, let me use a sports one, and then we'll we'll yeah. kind of expand on that. So, I was I was uh, I was at baseball practice last season. Um, Division one team, watching him, and one of their best hitters on the team, and I was watching him. And you know, every time he'd step into the box, he had this. It was, it was such a dialed-in routine in terms of like you see a lot of college baseball players. They hold the bat, look at the bat, take a breath. You know, they're probably telling themselves something. But it's, I watched him, and I was like, I could go do that because it was so clear. Um, I kind of break it down to like technical writing. I mean, I think we've all built something that had really good instructions, and we've all built something that had really shitty instructions that you're like, I, I, don't, I can't follow this crap. Like I can't, I don't even know what you're talking about here. Right. Something that has really good instructions, like it's step by step by step. So that's a good routine. So, so I watched it anyway. So, so I watched him do it. In other words, he could have taught it to me and I could have done that routine. Like it was that and it was every single time. Perfect. But what was interesting was, so a little bit later there was practicing and something happened and I don't know, I think he, he was on second base and he got thrown out at third. I don't know. But anyways, he was pissed off at himself. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. I'm watching him come back into the dugout and, and in terms of a one to 10 being pissed off, I mean, this was like a level five. This wasn't like throwing the helmet or anything or having a temper tantrum, but you can tell he was frustrated, which he should have been. He made a dumb mistake. Right. So he went back out on the field and when the practice got all over, I went over and I asked him, I said, okay, I said, you know, I talked to him. I said, hey, I could see your routine for getting ready was perfect. I said, what's your routine for flushing out that mistake? Like flushing it down the toilet and moving on. I said, when did you actually do that? And he was like, eh, I don't really remember. He said, I kind of just forgot about it by the time I got out on the field. And I said, okay. I said, so here's what I want to work with you on. I want you to come up with as clear of a routine for flushing a mistake away as you have for when you step in the box. And I gave him a couple examples. I said, I don't care if it's a, you walk around the end of the dugout and scream fuck as loud as you possibly can. And then you're done with it. And then you move back in. But now it's a, that's how you do it. Yeah. Or, or, or you sit there and process it in your own, because everybody does it differently. Some people are 
some people can let it go quicker than others. I mean, I, there's no like perfect answer for this. You got to kind of find your thing. But I said, you know, as so I gave him some examples, I said, or maybe it's literally the moment you go back on the field, when you step across that white line onto the field in your mind, you're like, you know, flush it, done with it, whatever. But something that's an actual routine that you can follow every single time so that it doesn't just go away whenever. Hmm. Cause I said, the problem's going to be, this was practice. It kind of went away pretty quickly. <laughs> What about when it's in a, in a huge game in the eighth inning and you just ran your team out of an inning when you're still down by a run? Well, now you're going to really need that routine to go to. And if you don't have one, you're, you're not going to be in the right mindset. Does that, does that kind of answer it better? Yeah, absolutely. Essentially like a, a process to let go of whatever. That, that, that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a letting go of or a, you know, a flushing it or a releasing the anchor or whatever you want to call it. But it's exactly one of those. Yeah. And then. And you could expand that, you know, you, I'm sure, man, when you're competing in CrossFit, there's stuff that doesn't go right. Mm -hmm. But then you've got another event you got to go do. Right. Yeah, no, I think in, <laughs> I know I said I was going to stop talking about the Patriots, but you got to think 28-3, right? Come back in the second <laughs> half and play like it's the first half, like that never happened. Like that is, that is a, probably the most overlooked part of that entire game, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. They didn't even really, didn't even really talk about that or it didn't come up that much. But yeah, you are, you're spot on. Absolutely spot on. Yeah, to not just be like buried mentally like that. That's pretty wild. And I and I got to believe it goes back to their their process and their routine. Sure. You know, they just they just kind of came out of look, they you know, whether whether they're up 23 down 23, they just had the same approach and that's I mean, it's so easy to talk about cuz rationally that makes sense. Right. But the problem is it, it's it's the funny thing about like kind of in, in, whether it's sports or just in life we know rationally to do it, but then kick the emotions all kick in, which the problem is so much of how we feel is emotionally, you know, f feeling confident or feeling ready to go is kind of some emotional feeling. So these two are always kind of at work, either they're either working together or they can work against you. It just depends on how you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the problem that <laughs> like human emotions are just such a shitty, unreliable construct to go off. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it, you know, but they're like so powerful and in the way you know, I mean, it really, now you're getting into the whole thing with how our brain works and, you know, yeah, you're firing on that amygdala and it's all, you know, it's all like ready to fight. And, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, kind of push those fight or flight things. And so how do you, how do you deal with that? And how do you breathe into that? Yeah, sure. When you work with high performers, what, what, is there anything common that you see that holds them back? I, I would say one commonality does go back to this piece of vulnerability. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, so much has been taught in, in sports of, you know, be tough and be aggressive and be on the attack and show no fear and, you know, kind of that mindset, which I, I get it in the middle of the competition. I mean, I, I totally get that. I and mean, I talk to baseball teams or sports teams all the time. I'm like, I get it. This, I'm not talking about vulnerability when you're on the mound and you have a meltdown. You don't need to show it there. But it does go back to that part of, we talked about it earlier about willing to ask for help. You know, willing, willing, really not just willing, but eager to take feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, eager to really like seek it out and like, Hey, tell me how I can get better. And I want to apply this thing and soaking that up and not taking it personal and not taking it like it's some attack or like something I did wrong. And, um, but that, that is a common one because, because that takes that vulnerability, which, which is scary. It's uncomfortable to, you know, to make ourselves a little bit vulnerable and, and ask questions and ask for help and seek that out. And, you know, and then, and then the next step is then, so now you get these high level athletes and a lot of them are really good at stuff. So now maybe they're giving some feedback to try something new that a lot of times maybe they got to go like backwards before they go forwards. Use that little cliche. Sure. Um, maybe you got to break something down. That's this old habit that before you can get here, you're going to have to, you're gonna get worse at something. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a high competitive athlete, that's, that's not very high in your list of cool stuff to do to get worse at something before you can get better at something. Right, right. Because number two, I have, I've met very few really high competitive athletes that are super patient people. You know, they're not exactly a patient group of people. So... Yeah. <laughs> which it works for them in a lot of areas. Yeah. Right. You know, it, it can also be a <laughs> work against us. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I think you touched on something that gets overlooked. When we look at these people doing great things, we think, man, they're talented, man, they're strong, man, they're fast, whatever this is. But we never think like, man, they're coachable. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, absolutely, man. And you, you know, you, you think about whether it's again, now he's those things that correlate Man, if you were coachable as a player, you're probably going to be coachable working in a, a, a team environment. That might be a family. <laughs> you know, someday you get a significant other, get married, whatever. There's going to be some coaching going on in that relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, 
helping each other, at least in, in, in my definition of a successful relationship, yeah. people that can have those kind of conversations or in a, you know, in a friendship or in a, in a team environment, whether it's a sports team or a, a business or whatever that, yeah, that, that coachability. How, and everybody says, well, I'm really coachable. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. You are. <laughs> right. Right. So you've made a mistake or something, or it's right in the heat of the moment, or you know, one of the one of the conversations I do, whether it's I do this one in business a lot or with athletes a lot, is I talk about what's your what's your Achilles heel for coachability, you know, for being coached. You know, what's that what's that thing that can make it really tough to be coached? And some players will talk about, or people will talk about, well, if it's not delivered in the right tone of voice, you know, sometimes then they take it personally, or or sometimes it's the timing of the whole thing. You know, um, so I've heard people, you know, another common one is when they already know they've screwed something up and then to be coached on it, you know, sometimes they don't want to be coached in that moment. You know, yeah. I was, I was, give, I was giving the analogy of driving down the street and I'll never forget this. I was driving down the road and I accidentally, like I had my kids in the back and I accidentally like kind of swerved into the lane next to me and kind of got close to this guy. And then I was like, crap, I'm, you know, I moved over and I already felt dumb. I was like, God, I felt making a mistake. And he, and as he kind of came by me, I was kind of going to give them the, Hey man, sorry about that. Well, he was like, you know, you bleeping, I mean, screaming at me and pointing at me. And all of a sudden, man, I felt this, you know, all of a sudden I was like, hey, fuck you, you know, the, you know I'm ready to have like a, an alter, you know, I, was like, I don't need any feedback. I know I messed it up. You don't need to tell me right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, and that's a good thing. Like if you're a CrossFit coach or whatever, delivery matters, you know? Everything, man. And knowing the timing of it, knowing where, and now it gets back into the, you know, kind of a, what I'll call kind of an older, these kind of an older school coach, you know, kind of the, 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 the drill, you know, the Bobby Knights of the world, um, you know, they, they were kind of known for coaching everybody the same way. Yeah. That was kind of the thing. I'm going to, I'm going to treat them all the same. And I, and I, I understand the philosophy behind it. I get, uh, you know, and it had, it had a lot of good outcomes. Well, it probably worked in a world, a different world too. There you, there you go. That's, that's totally it. You know, when you think about when a lot of those guys cut their teeth in coaching, the, the model for leadership was the military. Right. That's, that was the model. Right. So that's that's what they've modeled. I mean, and then, but then you look at a guy like uh, Mike Krzyzewski, who came from that era, but he has transitioned into and it's not that he's not tough on his players. Don't you know, some people think, well, they're not. No, he's just as tough on his players. It's just a little bit different. And like you said, he might handle so and so a little bit differently and he might talk to so and so a little bit differently. And he knows that a button for this kid is to reprimand him in front of everybody. So he's going to pull him to the side and chew his ass off to the side. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But no, knowing the players and the things. So, yeah, whether you're coaching a CrossFit athlete or you're coaching a, uh, a player or a, in the business world, knowing that the different people have different buttons and different, you know, when it comes to being coachable. Yeah, that's a that's a hard lesson I learned. Like try coming out of millennial like you're in the military. <laughs> Right. Yeah, no, it is, man. It's like that they, you know, I was, I was talking to a coach about it and I said, you know, you think about their world. I mean, think about the movies they watch and the music and I mean, all that stuff. It's so fast paced. I mean, if you go watch a movie these days, like there's no breathing point in the movies. It's just two hours of nonstop, just they gotta, turmoil. Yeah. They got to keep your attention. Bingo. Yeah. So, so when you, you know, when I tell a coach, when you yell at a kid, right, honestly, they just, they tend to just tune it out. As opposed to, you know, as opposed to taking and not that, not that you shouldn't do it. I had a really, really good coach tell me, he said his philosophy was, he said, he said, I got three bullets every season, you know, where I can just unload on, on the group or on a person. But any more than that, it gets kind of, eh, yep. yeah, yeah, just kind of, they just kind of tune it out. Yeah, I agree. When I was going through selection in the military, that's something that I, I noticed that like, even for myself and I would consider myself to be pretty hard nosed and thick skinned or whatever. Yeah. But if instructors started yelling at me enough, I realized I got to the point where I'm just like, I'm not even trying to get feedback anymore or, or hear your feedback and execute. I'm just like, if I do this, will you shut up? If I do this, will you shut up? And you're just doing things, trying to make them stop fucking talking. <laughs> right. Yeah. So now, now what, yeah, now you're learning not the thing you're learning what to do to get them to shut up. Right. Exactly. Which isn't what is not, that's not the, that's not the intended outcome. And that's not what that person wants either. Right. Terribly you effective. Know. <laughs> yeah, ter- terribly, terribly ineffective. But yeah, you're right. I think these guys have, you know, there's, there's been a shift. And back to your question, of what is, you know, what is leadership? I mean, I think that thing of being able to, you know, look and approach people differently, at least from my definition, I think that's a really, really key part. I, I believe that's a really good coaches, really good leaders, um, really good, you know, role models and mentors can do. Yeah, hell yeah. So the Lionheart Kicker, final question we try to ask every guest, and that is, if you could give blanket advice based on the experiences that you've had and the things that you've done and it were going to be translated to every language and it were guaranteed that everybody in the world would hear your advice. Uh, what would you tell people? I would tell them that 
no, no matter where you are in life, no matter what you're doing, number one is this, we're all in a place where we can get better and grow. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but I wear a little reminder of that, a little white wristband on my wrist and it's a reminder of kind of that white belt mindset. Um, and it, and it, and it really is from that mindset of the martial arts of the beginner, which is that no matter what happens, no matter what situation I'm in, no matter what situation any of us in, we can get a little bit better and grow from it. And, you know, I, I think for me, that's been one of the biggest, you know, biggest important things that you know, I try to instill with other people as well is that always put yourself in that mindset of the beginner, the learner, you know, and be eager to learn every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. We had a guest a few, uh, few a while back, George Briones, and he said, every day I wake up like I'm at the bottom of the hill. I'm at the bottom of the mountain and it's time to climb. No, it, it is exactly it. And having kids, man, I get to I get to watch that with you know with their eagerness and excitement for everything. And it's it's a good reminder for me as an adult that man, I, you know, that, that's a choice to look at stuff and be excited about it or to not be excited about it. And 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 if there's anything I've learned from life that when I forget to be excited about stuff, life tends to come across and come along and take that shit away from you. And then all of a sudden you'll be reminded of why that thing was so important to you, whether that stuff, people experiences, things. I mean, that's, it, it's kind of what happens. We either make, I either make it a habit to be grateful for it or life will come along and remind me. And it's usually not in the most pleasant way. Right, right. Yeah. There's uh, <laughs> those that are humble and then those that are about to be right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I love that. I'd heard that before. That's a perfect, yeah. perfect synopsis of that little statement. Yes. Yeah. So for people that are listening to this and uh, want to just kind of follow along with you and support your journey, how can they do that? Um, the easiest way is, you know, like so there's the, the, the website itself is just team elite performance.com. And then, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a Twitter person too, although I don't you know, use it a ton, but it's just a way to communicate with people. And so we, I've got a, a site on there. It's just team, um, team elite P E R F team elite P E R F is the, is the Twitter site as well. So, you know, when I just, you know, put stuff on there that seems to be helpful for people or teams or people that I'm working with and, you know, follow up with them there. Yeah, for sure. And then, and you do work with organizations outside of sports too, like if like companies, whatever, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, we do a fair amount with you know, kind of what I call the corporate world and the educational world, and you know, people. That's it's kind of that mindset of people that want to want to get better at something. Perfect. Well, thanks for being on, man. I really appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate your time. It was good to good to chat with you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or would like to suggest a guest, Send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <sighs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland,